Good afternoon. Can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus? The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions, and the first por portfolio is COVID-19 recovery and parliamentary business. If a member wishes to ask a supplementary question, they should uh, indicate so by pressing the request to speak button or by entering R. Uh, in the uh, chat room function. And I call question number one, Alex Go Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has for the future of the COVID-19 certification scheme. Deputy First Minister, John Spinney. Presiding Officer, we've lifted the legal requirement for venues to operate a COVID certification scheme. Some venues may opt to use certification to make their customers and staff feel safer. The COVID status app will remain in place for as long as it is needed to facilitate international travel. A domestic certification scheme will remain in our package of protective measures and may be used if required in the future to manage COVID outbreaks, though we hope that will not be necessary. Alex Hamilton. I am very grateful for the Deputy First Minister for that reply. Presiding officer, in her COVID statement last month, as the DFM has just said, the First Minister said that these passes would be retained on a voluntary basis for any business that wanted to use them. This effectively creates an unregulated scheme with businesses free to refuse custom to anyone on the basis of them not having the right piece of paper or the correct barcode on their phone. And there was no suggestion of when this would end. Does the Deputy First Minister agree that this creates a potentially dangerous loophole where the liberties and rights of Scots to medical privacy could be undermined indefinitely? Uh, no, I don't take that view because the arrangements around the COVID certification app and the gathering and the handling of and processing of information is all very carefully regulated and compliant. And obviously any business has got to be mindful of its own policies and decisions and legal obligations in the way in which they would uh, administer any schemes. So uh, I'm satisfied about legal compliance and obviously the onus is on a business to ensure that they too are operating with legal compliance. Supplementary, Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Given that this entire debacle has cost the taxpayer £7 million, £7 million which went to Danish and American companies to build an app that many Scottish companies, including those in Forth Valley, could have made cheaper and more effectively. What lessons has the Deputy First Minister learned from this experience, and what does he plan to do to ensure such a thing does not happen again? Deputy First Minister. Well, I, 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 I just do not recognise the characterisation that Mr Kerr puts on this. There is an open procurement process in which the Government has to ensure that these services are procured properly and with legal compliance, and that has been followed in these circumstances. Uh, the scheme was expanded significantly beyond its original purpose, which is why it cost more money. Clearly, if we expand a scheme beyond its original concept, it is going to cost more money. I think that just is as straightforward as, um, uh, as B following A. Um, so the, the government it subjects all of its decisions to careful scrutiny about financial handling, about legal compliance, about compliance with other regulatory arrangements, and this scheme has complied in every aspect. And of course, I would stress, it is a valuable tool in ensuring that we can take the necessary steps to suppress the circulation of the virus, and for international travellers, a crucial piece of, of, of evidence to enable individuals to undertake international travel. And if Mr Kerr wants to support our airports, in trying to attract more custom, then of course those uh, individual uh, airports will require their uh, customers to be able to comply with the requirements of the COVID status app. And I call uh, supplementary from Sharon Dowie. Uh, Ms Dowie, did you, Ms Dowie not wish to seek a supplementary in this? No, no sorry, it's question five. Press the buzzer, that's why I called you. Okay, uh, question number two, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what work and action across government is undertaking to support local authorities and local communities in their recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Deputy First Minister. Presiding Officer, across government we are working closely with our partners in local government and the third sector to deliver outcomes that will bring about a fairer future, particularly for those who have been most affected during the pandemic. By working together, we will align services around the individuals and the families who need them. The COVID recovery strategy sets out clearly the outcomes we will uh, improve for communities. 
We will increase financial security for low-income households, enhance the well-being of children and young people, and create good green jobs and fair work through a package of targeted actions. Alongside the President of COSLA, I chair the COVID Recovery Strategy Programme Board, and last week we met to progress further this ambitious transformation of public services. Ronan Mackay. Thank the Deputy First Minister for the answer. Um, businesses will play a crucial role in recovery of local communities up and down the country. However, large rises in energy bills, increased costs for everyday essentials and rising interest rates will mean that businesses will see their margins squeezed. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister whether he considers that the measures set out in the Chancellor's statement just hours ago will have any substantive effect on businesses already struggling with Brexit-related import costs, supply chain problems, uh, as the high streets that serve our communities try to recover from the impacts of the pandemic? Deputy First Minister. President, I haven't had a, a, a lengthy opportunity because of other business to uh, take in all of the details of the spring statement, but I, I don't think I heard enough in that statement to be confident that businesses have been protected from the challenges that are being faced. There will be some measures that will have an effect, such as the reduction in fuel duty, but the implications of Brexit and particularly on the availability of labour, are absolutely colossal challenges for the business sector. I hear about it every week in my constituency from uh, organisations that cannot recruit enough staff because of the removal of free movement of EU citizens. So I don't think what I've heard so far today will give me confidence that the business community has been given the support that it requires to, uh, to address the challenges that are currently faced by business. Supplementary Mercedes Vialba. Thank you. Universities are a vital part of many local communities, and we must ensure they recover from the pandemic in a way which protects the health of students and staff. But in light of rising COVID cases nationally, we continue to see outbreaks at universities like St Andrews, where over 450 students tested positive in a single week. So does the Scottish Government agree that we should be looking at continuing to mandate protections like face coverings, testing on campuses, social distancing and ventilation in our universities? Deputy First Minister. I, I, I acknowledge the significance of the points that Ms Vialba puts to me because there, it, we're obviously at this present moment going through very significant levels of community transmission and that is pre presenting itself in a number of ways in university and college campuses around the country where it's important that we're taking every measure to sustain the education of young people and to protect their safety into the bargain. So in the strategic framework the government has published, there are a range of baseline measures that we expect institutions to be taking forward. Some of those will be around ventilation, for example. Uh, obviously, we have a mandatory position on face coverings. As Ms Vialba will realise, that's not universally welcomed within Parliament. The Conservative Party have vigorously opposed uh, our extension of the face coverings measures, but I think they are appropriate for this moment, given the significance of the challenges that we face. And of course, the Cabinet will consider these measures for review at its meeting on Tuesday, and there will be a statement to Parliament next week about these issues. And supplementary, Pam Duncan Glancy, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. The additional funding given to the third sector during the pandemic was much needed and essential to allow them to offer the crucial support to families that they did. But this year's budget hands a cut of around £1 million to third sector organisations. The need for their advice and services has never been more required, particularly as, as we recover from the pandemic, but also in the cost of living crisis and, of course, um, as a result of the uh, war in Ukraine and people coming here to take refuge. What engagement is the Scottish Government having with the third sector to ensure that adequate funding arrangements are in place? And can it provide an update on any further consideration it's given to developing multi-year funding models? Deputy First Minister. The question of multi-year funding models is obviously a, an issue which arises from the degree of um, prospective information we have on the financial arrangements from the United Kingdom Government. We are now in a different situation at this moment because we now have a longer um, uh, line of sight than we have had for a number of years. And obviously the France Secretary will reflect on those points because it, it, it is desirable for us to give multi-year settlements. And uh, I, I know that is a position that the France Secretary has shared with the third sector. I would encourage Pam Duncan Glancy to look at all budget lines, not just uh, individual budget lines where there may be changes that um, members would like to see uh, reversed. Uh, there is a range of different funding streams the government is making available to third sector organisations. And indeed, within the COVID recovery strategy, there is a very heavy emphasis on the role of the third sector in supporting 
the work on COVID recovery. Uh, there will be more said, of course, tomorrow when the Social Justice Secretary sets out the approach on the Child Poverty uh, Implementation Plan. Um, that information will be shared with Parliament tomorrow. And uh, obviously, the third sector is critical in supporting our work to eliminate child poverty in our country. Question number three not lost. Question number four, Edward Mountain. Starting officer, to ask the Scottish Government what percentage of FOI requests made to it were answered within 20 working days within the last 12 months. Minister George Adam. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the member for his question. Over the 2021 calendar year, we responded to over 4,000 FOI requests, 86 per cent of which were answered within the statutory deadline. This is broadly in line with the average of, uh, for other Scottish public authorities and represents continued recovery of our performance since the start of the pandemic. Edward Mountain. Well, that's interesting, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Minister for that answer. I've had numerous examples, perhaps it's just me, where FOI requests have not been responded to within time limits, even ones which I've had to appeal. Even such a simple question as when will vessels 801 and 802 be delivered has been left unanswered for over four weeks. Surely a government minister with their finger on the pulse should know the answer to that. And will the minister undertake to look at the 14 per cent which didn't make uh, the cut and find out why? Minister. No, uh, simple answer to the question asked by Mr Mountain, I would say may, there are other ways of parliamentary scrutiny. He can ask questions by a parliamentary question, should he wish a, a PQ, he could do that as well. Uh, so there are, there are opportunities. Uh, Minister, could you resume just a second? Could we please have less sedentary uh, comment? A question has been asked. Please let the Minister answer. That is the courteous way to proceed. Minister, please resume. Just in summary, President Officer, there are more than uh, adequate measures for members to be able to ask questions of anything they wish within this chamber. Uh, question number five, Sharon Dye. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its policies and actions across government will support South Ayrshire to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Deputy First Minister. President Officer, priorities for recovery will vary by location and we are committed across government to working with communities to understand local needs and tailor support to se services to support them. We announced an £80 million COVID economic recovery fund for local authorities to target support for businesses and communities and South Ayrshire will receive more than £1.68 million and will have full discretion over how to target support to maximise economic recovery. Further to this, the Scottish Government is investing £103 million in the Ayrshire growth deal which will see transformational investment in projects across Ayrshire to support long-term inclusive growth. Regional partners estimate the deal will create 7,000 new jobs and unlock an additional £300 million from the private sector. Sharon Dowie. Thank you. In my constituency, I was proud to see both communities and third sector organisations coming together to support South Ayrshire Lifeline when the pandem pandemic began. That allowed them to expand services like their helpline or their prescription collection and distribution network but this would not be possible without people going above and beyond for their communities. Will the Deputy First Minister outline how the Scottish Government will continue to fund the third sector and retain people in local organisations? Deputy First Minister. I think this is a very important issue, and the type of services that Sharon Dowie talks about are increasingly evident within our communities and increasingly developing because capacity has been built within communities to make sure these services and support can be available on an ongoing basis. I had a very helpful conversation just last week with, the, uh, with a number of community development organisations to establish how the very good example that Sharon Dowie puts to me can be replicated in other parts of the country. There are many other comparable examples that are working well. So I'm keen to explore how we can ensure that capacity exists, not just to deal with a COVID situation, but it may be relevant for a, a, a winter weather situation or a flooding situation or other examples where we can build community capacity to assist the public services in addressing need within communities. So uh, I welcome uh, information about the example that Sharon Dowie has put to me and I'm sure the government is very keen to build that community capacity. A supplementary, Siobhan Brown. Thank you, De Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I ask Cabinet Secretary how much money the Scottish Government has spent in South Ayrshire to mitigate the UK Government's policies that are hitting families in my constituency hard as we recover from the pandemic? Deputy First Minister. 
President Officer, uh, there is a number of funding streams that the Government has made available in the South Ayrshire area. Obviously, in the local government France settlement, the local authority in South Ayrshire is receiving funding of £247.6 million, which represents a real terms increase of 8.2 per cent for South Ayrshire. And there is also cost of living support um, of nearly £5 million, um, which will be made available to uh, South Ayrshire. In addition to that, South Ayrshire Council was allocated £533,000 from the flexible element of the Winter Support Fund. And, uh, we also allocated more than £1.7 million in discretionary housing payment to South Ayrshire Council to fully mitigate against the damaging effects of the UK Government's bedroom tax. Question number six, Emma Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps are being taken with ministerial colleagues across government to ensure that Scotland's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic addresses the reported disproportionate impact of the pandemic on low-income households. Deputy First Minister. President Officer, our strategy uh, is focused on those most affected during the pandemic and on creating a, a fairer future for uh, everyone affected. We will do this by transforming public services to ensure that they are person-centred in design and delivery, working closely with our partners, including COSLA, local government, the third sector and the private sector. This will multiply the impact of our actions and support communities and the most vulnerable to thrive. The Government has declared tackling child poverty a national mission and is working to mobilise all of Scotland to help us achieve this goal. We will publish the second Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan tomorrow, which will outcome the transformational actions we will take alongside our delivery partners to tackle child poverty, which lies at the very heart of the COVID recovery strategy. Emirati. I, I thank the Deputy First Minister for that response. Recent polling suggests that more than 80 per cent of people in Scotland are worried about the Tory cost of living crisis, with food, fuel and household bills skyrocketing. As inflation soars to a 30-year high, does the Deputy First Minister consider that the UK Government's spring budget goes anywhere near far enough to reverse the damage caused by a decade of Tory cuts? Because without drastic action, those low-income households will not be a part of Scotland's recovery. Deputy First Minister. I, I, Emma Roddick makes a very fair point. I have highlighted at the heart of our COVID recovery strategy uh, is the drive to tackle and eliminate child poverty. On the one hand, the Scottish Government has just taken a decision uh, in, uh, announced in the Budget in December to be applied in the next financial year to uh, increase the Scottish child payment. But at the same time, the United Kingdom Government has removed important increases that were put in place on universal credit. So uh, th there is one glaring example where the Scottish Government is trying to act to tackle child poverty and our efforts are undermined by the actions of the United Kingdom Government. As I said in my answer to Rona Mackay, I have not had uh, a large amount of time to take in all of the details of the spring statement, but I have heard enough to, and I heard a very strong contribution from my parliamentary colleague Alison Thoulis in the budget statement, in the spring statement, uh, which made the point that not nearly enough had been taken to, to tackle the effects of poverty on low-income households. That is obviously at the heart of the Scottish Government's strategy, and we would like to be, have our actions reinforced, not undermined, by the UK Government. Question number seven, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will remove the provisions on the extension of emergency powers from the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Scotland Bill. Deputy First Minister. President, so the Government will, of course, consider carefully the views of Parliament as it completes stage one scrutiny of the Bill. However, I must stress that removing key provisions from the Bill in the way that Ms Bailey suggests would mean that Scotland would not have the public health protection measures in place which are needed to counter future public health threats. I do, no, I do not believe that is in the public interest. Jackie Bailey. The Deputy First Minister has chosen to use the made affirmative procedure, which means that measures can be routinely introduced without parliamentary scrutiny or approval in advance. That does not allow for consultation. It does not allow for the voice of our constituents to be heard in this chamber. The Parliament has demonstrated that it can operate quickly. Let me remind Mr Swinney of primary legislation that we passed in a week. Indeed, it was the very first bill considered by the Parliament, and COVID bills um, were subsequently done in a matter of days. So rather than risk the other positive measures 
in the bill? Will John Swinney change the provisions on the extension of emergency powers so they are at least subject to scrutiny in advance? Deputy First Minister. I, I, I don't think Jackie Bailey's characterisation of the issue um, is appropriate uh, in these circumstances. The made affirmative procedure is only ever used where time circumstances do not allow us to undertake the normal consultation and dialogue around the affirmative procedure. And I have gone on the record with the uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee to make it clear that the Government does not routinely intend to utilise the made affirmative procedure. We would, what we would prefer to use the affirmative process to enable the type of dialogue that Jackie Bailey talks about. So, what, what the Government is trying to do, and I am very keen to engage with Parliament on this question, is make sure that we have a statute book that enables us, having learnt the lessons of COVID, to be able to respond swiftly and promptly to challenges that may come towards us. And Jackie Bailey knows the issues of COVID well. She knows how quickly events have changed in front of us. So the legislative framework that we are putting in place is designed to create that, 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 that capacity to act swiftly. Um, I am very keen to make sure that I work with parliamentary colleagues to try to address the legitimate concerns on this question. But fundamentally, we must have a statute book that is fit to deal with the challenge of the pandemic, and that is my objective in this legislation. I have received a number of requests for supplementaries. I intend to take uh, each of them. Uh, and firstly, from Sandesh Gohani. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, to ensure Parliament able to scrutinise in advance of emergency powers being acted, could we agree a, a raft of emergency powers, leave them dormant, and then if the need arises, we can get a statement either virtual or in person, and within the time it would take to play a football match, we'd be able to grant the government the powers? Yeah. Deputy First Minister. Well, that's a rather interesting development of the Conservative position, which I am going to say I'm very happy to explore with the Conservatives, since we're now talking Turkey about this issue. I think this is very welcome. Um, maybe Jackie Bailey will be catching up with the new reformist thinking of the, the Conservatives once again have moved ahead and dumped Jackie Bailey from the Better Together Alliance. But I, I, I welcome Dr Gahani's suggestion. Uh, what we're trying to do, and I come back to what I said in my answer to Jackie Bailey, is to make sure there is a parliamentary a framework of legislation in place that enables Parliament to act quickly where we require to do so. Dr Gahani offers a, 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 an interesting perspective on that. It's obviously something that can be advanced within the legislative process, and if he would care to write to me, and I'd be very happy to have a meeting with him and his colleagues to explore what might be involved in some of these questions, because, as always, I am very keen to build consensus within this parliamentary chamber. Supplementary, Willie Rennie. Well, that's, that's a very interesting development of the government's position, because when I asked the very same question to the Education Secretary in the Education Committee, she rejected it out of hand. So I would suggest a bit of coordination on the government's side. The Children's Commissioner gave some very important evidence to the Education Committee about this bill. The Commissioner said they had re considerable concerns that permanent powers may not be lawful under Article 15 of the ECHR. So why is the Deputy First Minister ignoring the concerns of the Children's Commissioner? Deputy well, First I'm Minister. Not, I, I'm not ignoring them. I'm addressing them. Because what ministers have to do, and I understand the perspective of commentators and commissioners, but ministers have duties to protect public health. And people like Mr Rennie come here and complain if ministers don't act quick enough to protect public health. And he shakes his head. I've sat here and listened to him complaining about ministers not acting quickly enough to do certain things. So I'm very happy to engage in discussion and dialogue about the provisions of the bill. But there is one point which is absolutely fundamental. We must have a legislative framework in place that will allow us to act quickly should the circumstances arise. And that is the purpose of this legislation, and that is what the Government will engage constructively with Parliament to try to achieve. And supplementary, John Mason. 
Hey, thank you. Uh, the opposition members are often whining when Scotland is a little bit different from England. So can the Deputy First Minister clarify, would these provisions move us closer to the provisions in England or further away? Deputy First Minister. Well, the, 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 the statute book in England and Wales contains many of these provisions which have enabled the United Kingdom Government and the Welsh Assembly Government to act uh, within their legal framework uh, to, 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 uh, in, in a swift and immediate fashion. So one of the points that is, you know, Mr Mason characterised how the opposition parties sometimes contribute to the debate. I will not, I will not uh, comment on his assessment, but what I will say is that the opposition often come here and ask us to learn lessons. And we've learned a lesson from the pandemic, and that is that our statutory framework was not adequate to deal with these issues. And that's what I'm trying to address in the legislation that's before Parliament. And question number eight, Pauline McNeill. To ask the Scottish Government how its policies across government will support people living in Glasgow to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Deputy First Minister. President Officer, by working collaboratively with our partners in local government, business and the third sector, we will deliver a strong recovery that meets the needs uh, to each, specific to each area. For example, the Glasgow City Region deal empowers Glasgow and its city region partners to identify, manage and deliver a programme of investments to stimulate economic growth and create jobs in their areas, supporting the region to achieve its shared long-term vision for the local economy. Uh, the Government is actively involved in dialogue with the Glasgow City Region deal and we will continue that dialogue uh, with our focus on recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Pauline McNeill. A report published last week by PricewaterhouseCoopers said that Glasgow had slower growth in Aberdeen and Edinburgh in 2021 and that will continue this year. Uh, UK average growth across 50 cities measured in the report was 7.4%, but worryingly, Glasgow is only at 4.4%. Yesterday, the House of Commons Scottish Affairs Committee, in an excellent report, published um, this report and highlighted the airports in Scotland, the bosses of AGS who own Glasgow and Aberdeen, noted that the pandemic had set their sights back a decade, not just for the loss of passengers, but the loss of connectivity to the whole of Glasgow and its city region. So therefore, what more evidence does the government need that Glasgow is in trouble and it needs more assistance, special attention? So could the government elaborate a bit more on what intervention they would seek to help Glasgow city region? Deputy First Minister. I, I, I acknowledge the importance of ensuring that every part of the country is supported to recover, and it's vital that that's the case in the city of Glasgow. Uh, and, and in the city region area. So the government is engaged with the uh, city region partnership. Uh, we obviously take a range of different interventions and measures to enhance the, the transport infrastructure, to ensure that there is adequate connectivity. Uh, ministerial colleagues are actively involved in discussions on these questions with the relevant organisations. Uh, we have a skills investment in the college and university sector in Glasgow in the west of Scotland which is very significant to make sure that the skills that are required for the future are adequately delivered, and also that we are supporting the recovery of uh, some key sectors that are affected by the pandemic. Now, if we look at the overall position on economic recovery, the economy is broadly back to where it was pre-pandemic, and the key challenge is to make sure that the many strengths of the city of Glasgow and its surrounding areas are built upon to ensure that all citizens can appreciate and enjoy uh, the, 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 the proceeds of economic growth and opportunity, and that's at the heart of the dialogue between the government and local authorities. And brief supplementary, please, Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Can the DFM touch on how much Glasgow stands to benefit from the Regional Economic Partnership Fund and how the Scottish Government envisions that that funding will support Glasgow's economic recovery? Deputy First Minister. Obviously, the, the funding that, to which Mr Kidd refers is important. Uh, we have to consider the, the, the ways in which uh, that can have an effect on uh, economic opportunities within the City of Glasgow. Um, applications are in the process of being assessed by officials, and I can confirm that Glasgow have submitted an application and decisions will be made in due course um, and notified. But the objective of the 
um, the, 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 the partnership is about uh, supporting the internationalisation of the regional economy and ensuring that the long-term foundations of the city and regional economy are secure, and that will lie at the heart of decision-making around the fund. Thank you. Uh, and that concludes portfolio questions on COVID-19 recovery and parliamentary business. There will be a very short pause. Uh, before we move on to the next portfolio questions, in the event that front bench teams wish to change position. Thank you. Energy and Transport. If a member wishes to request a supplementary uh, question, they should press their request to speak button during the relevant question or enter the letter R. Uh, in the chat function during the relevant question. I call question number one, Annie Wells, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on when it is scheduled to meet with UK Government Ministers to discuss the implementation of the Energy Company Obligation for Steam in Scotland? Minister Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Energy Company Obligation is a UK Government scheme Although it is scheduled to begin in April this year, the design of the ECO4 scheme has not been confirmed by the UK Government. Since June last year, we have repeatedly attempted to engage with UK Ministers on the future of uh, both the Warm Home Discount and ECO, but our approaches have not been answered. I would welcome a meeting with UK Government Ministers to discuss how ECO can better tackle fuel poverty and deliver a just transition in Scotland. Annie Wells. I have been in touch with energy businesses across Glasgow who are extremely concerned about the lack of communication from the SNP Green Government regarding a transition period between the ECO3 and ECO4 schemes. They have revealed to me that if there is no such confirmation of a transition period, with EOC due to expire in just eight days' time, they fear many jobs across Glasgow could be relocated to England and Wales. So, can the Minister urgently clarify that an EO ECO3 interim period will apply in Scotland to help save these jobs? Minister. Well, I, uh, I have to say that I uh, very much appreciate the frustration that many people have with the lack of clarity, and that clarity is needed. But it is the UK Government which has refused still to confirm what the design of the ECO4 scheme will be. Even though it is due to come into force uh, in April, uh, we do not anticipate seeing the, the regulations laid to define it uh, until April. And some of the changes signalled in the UK Government's response to the public consultation appear to be based on the English definition of fuel poverty, which may limit the number uh, of eligible Scottish properties. Just for clarity, presiding officer, we have known for a long time that this change was coming. In February 2021, the Scottish Government proposed combining the warm home discount and eco as a single, more flexible fuel poverty scheme in Scotland. Scottish ministers wrote to their UK counterparts in June and in October and in December asking whether this approach would be acceptable to the UK Government, and we have still not had an answer from the UK Government one way or the other. Question number two, Mercedes Vialba. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking in relation to green scales to remove barriers facing offshore oil and gas workers in transitioning to green jobs in the offshore energy sector. Minister Lorna Slater. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am pleased that OPITO, with the Scottish Government support, through the Energy Skills Alliance, is making excellent progress towards the enabling of a skills passport. In the coming months, ESA will publish their skills transition plan, which will set out work to date and next steps. There has been great progress in what is a complicated and important piece of work that will support the offshore workforce in their transition journey. Mercedes Bialba. Thank you. I thank the Minister for her response. And I look forward to meeting with her um, tomorrow alongside trade unions and climate campaigners to discuss the need for an offshore training passport. But one of the other barriers facing offshore oil and gas workers in transitioning to green jobs is the poor employment practices in the offshore wind supply chain. The Scottish Government often talks of its commitment to fair work. So will it support collect, uh, sectoral collective bargaining in the offshore wind industry? Minister. I thank the member very much for that question, and I do look forward to seeing her tomorrow to discuss progress on the offshore skills passport. Um, the Scottish Government absolutely supports workers and um, 
you'll see in the National Strategy for Economic Fra uh, Transformation, that we support collective bargaining and workers having more of a say in, in how their jobs are executed. A supplementary, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In a written answer to me, Minister Richard Lockhead admitted that this government, having only delivered approximately one in 20 of the offshore wind jobs that it forecast, proposes to widen the definition of a green job. He proposes to use a different definition from the one the ONS, and therefore the rest of the UK, is using. Does the Minister accept that widening the definition would give a distorted picture on how this government is really performing on the creation of green jobs and will make it impossible to meaningfully compare with the rest of the UK? Minister. I thank the member very much for that question. The discussion of what is a green job is an absolute live one. It is fair to say that in the future all jobs will be green jobs. Tackling the climate crisis isn't something that we can put in a box. Isn't that everybody needs to play their part, all sectors need to pay their part. Of course, we, it's useful to have a definition in to, when we're looking at planning training and when we're looking at planning investment, uh, but I think it's correct. Uh, the Minister, Scottish Government Minister, 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 please resume your seat a second. Again, I have to please call for some courtesy from the Conservative benches. Thank you, Minister, please resume. I think it's absolutely appropriate that Scottish, Scotland develops a definition of green jobs that is appropriate for our workforce and our industry here. Question number three, not lodged. Question number four, withdrawn. Question number five, Michelle Thompson. Government, to ask the Scottish Government what ministerial discussions have taken place regarding whether its net zero ambitions could be supported through the introduction of new fiscal measures. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, ministers regularly consider new policies, proposals and fiscal uh, regulatory measures to accelerate our transition to net zero. While Scottish ministers uh, endeavour to take all actions required to reach net zero, many levers do sit within reserved competences. For example, areas such as transmission charging sit with the UK Government and presently act as a disincentive to renewable energy investment in Scotland. Therefore, it is essential that the UK Government works, within, works with the Scottish Government to ensure that fiscal measures support their net zero ambitions. Michelle Thompson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. The ambitious net zero targets set by the Scottish Government will not only require to be funded, but the frameworks developed too. This cannot be done in isolation without consideration by those with the full fiscal levers of what measures could be utilised. But given the scale of the challenge and the fact that the majority of green tax powers are reserved to the UK Government, does the Cabinet Secretary share my concern at the recent Westminster Public Accounts Committee report that noted the UK Government has no clear plan for how the transition to net zero will be funded? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, given that a number of the crucial levers, uh, including but not limited to green tax pools, are reserved to the UK Government, I do share the members uh, concern and in particular the issues that were highlighted by the Public Accounts Committee about the UK Government's uh, lack of any clear plan on how the transition to net zero will be uh, funded. Uh, prior to of course, the publication of the UK Government's uh, net zero uh, strategy, we made consistent calls uh, for action to be taken in a number of crucial areas which are within, within reserved competences. And while the strategy contained a number of positive uh, steps to be taken to help support uh, achieving net zero, it was a concern that there was no clear indication as to how these actions would be taken forward at a fiscal uh, level. That is why it is absolutely essential that the UK Government do work with the Scottish Government in ensuring that the fiscal measures that are within the uh, hold of the UK Government that they also meet Scotland's ambitious climate change targets. And that's why, for example, as I've highlighted, issues such as transmission charging presently act as a disincentive, and it's therefore essential that the fiscal measures are consistent with achieving net zero by 2045. Question number six, Colette Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met representatives from the energy regulator of GEM and what was discussed. My, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I last met with off GEM uh, Gas and Electricity Market uh, Authority Board on the 9th of February 2022. This was a general catch-up with the Board, uh, but the main topics discussed, including the price cap announcement, 
the outcome of Crown Estate Scotland's Scotland leasing round and transmission charges. Uh, Scottish Government officials continue to meet and engage with Ofgem on a regular basis. Colette Stevenson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. With rising energy costs and the increase in the price cap, the Tory cost of living crisis is about to escalate. Can the Cabinet Secretary set out the average cost per household of UK government imposed, va imposed VAT and energy policy costs? And does he agree with me that the Tories must cut VAT from household energy bills and immediately implement a fairer warm home discount scheme to support people? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, uh, Ofgem have estimated that the VAT component of the average household fu dual fuel energy bill uh, will be around £60 per year, and policy costs added uh, are over £150 more. Uh, this is an issue which I have uh, taken up with the UK Government uh, previously uh, on a number of occasions to ask them to look at a temporary cut to VAT. Uh, alongside that, we have also asked them to take action on the Warm Homes Discount Scheme uh, and also to review the socio-environmental costs which are included on energy bills. Uh, actions which we believe uh, collectively could help to support uh, families facing spiralling energy costs which are added to the wider cost of living crisis which the Conservative Government are responsible for, which is why it is essential that we see proper concerted action by the UK Government to address uh, this crisis. Uh, sadly, that was lacking in the spring statement. However, the reality is that households will still face these very considerable energy costs alongside rising cost of living, uh, costs uh, which the UK Government are responsible for taking action on. And I have a number of supplementaries, and I intend to take each of them. The first from Eleanor Whittam, who is joining us remotely. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. For many rural households in my constituency who are off-grid and use oil as their primary source of heating, there are no price cap protections, with many people seeing price increases from around £50 per litre to £1.40 with minimum delivery quotas and payment required on delivery. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree the UK Government must intervene to tackle the unregulated heating oil industry to prevent uncertainty and extreme fuel poverty for rural households? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, this is an area uh, which is unregulated within the energy market. It is an issue which we have uh, raised on a consistent basis with the UK Government. It particularly impacts on those who live in rural areas in uh, Scotland. Uh, and I uh, recognise the points which uh, uh, the Member is making on behalf of her constituents who saw very significant increases in the cost of uh, oil for uh, oil heating systems. And that is why we believe there is a need for proper regulation in this sector to protect households, but also to make sure that it addresses the ever-increasing costs uh, that those who are reliant on oil heating uh, are now facing. And again, this is an area of policy which we want to see the UK Government taking action on and to do so urgently. A supplementary Faisal Chaudhry. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. A constituent has recently argued that they, they believe the estimated energy bill they were given during the latest wave of the pandemic were excessive. Has the Scottish Government had any discussion with Ofgem on the use of estimated bills where meter reading were not able to be taken? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, uh, this is an area which is regulated by uh, Ofgem. If the member has a particular concern about a constituent's uh, circumstances, he can pursue that directly with Ofgem uh, in order to ask them to consider the complaint they may have. Uh, estimated bills will have a role to play for some households, but there is a process which can be used for individuals to ask for that to be revised um, on the basis of submitting uh, a reading uh, on these matters. Uh, but if the member is, uh, is constituent is continuing to experience problems, there is advice that can be provided on pursuing these issues with their energy supplier to ensure that their energy bill is, reflected or is reflective of the use of energy, uh, given that their previous bills have been based upon estimates. And supplementary, Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. My question relates to the targeted charging review of transmission demand residual. Off-gem analysis of domestic consumers highlights that the no-floor approach could result in consumers in North Scotland receiving credits driven by consumption during the evening peak. A floor approach shows that this would result in an overall decrease in Tenuos charges for typical domestic 
consumers apart from those in Scotland. For North Scotland in particular, they note that charges will increase compared with the current charges given the assistance for area with high electricity distribution costs policy. The North East pays more again. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with, the flo with flooring the forward-looking charge at zero? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, what I do agree with the uh, uh, officer is the existing system is not fit for purpose, uh, which is why the whole system uh, needs to be changed. We have a, a system which is geared just now, where predominantly uh, uh, the Tunus, uh, the, the Tunus uh, charging regime is based upon uh, uh, providing energy as close to the consumer as possible. Whereas the reality is, the reality is that in moving to a net zero age, is that the vast majority of it will be much more distant from centres of population. And that's why it's important that any regime that we have in place is one which is reflective of the need to move to net zero. And alongside that, any price cap mechanisms which are been introduced off the back of that as well, and alongside uh, these measures, need to be reflective of the household situ situation, including within our rural areas. And as yet, Ofgem have failed to take forward an approach that is reflective of the needs here in Scotland. Question number seven has been withdrawn. Question number eight, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Climate Change Committee's latest report, Is Scotland Climate Ready?, which states that progress in delivering climate change adaptation measures in Scotland has stalled. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, preparing for the impacts of climate change, which are locked in, forms a key part of a just transition, and we are making real progress on this. This includes an extra £150 million for flood risk management and £12 million for coastal change adaptation over this Parliament. We are pleased that the Committee on Climate Change supports our vision for a climate resilient Scotland. However, we accept that more needs to be done. This is a global challenge and we are not alone in needing to exhilarate progress. We are now considering the Committee's recommendations and will respond to the recommendations in due course. Brian Whittle. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but perhaps I can help the Cabinet Secretary give the real answer to Michelle Thompson's questions around the concerns reaching Scotland's net zero targets. The Climate Change Committee's report is scathing in its criticism of the Scottish Government. It says actions is not being implemented with sufficient scale and urgency, there is no credible planning to adapt farmland habitats and species, and there is a gap in planning for maintenance of a weather resilient energy system, insufficient inclusion of adaptation and plans for many key infrastructure sectors and repeated criticisms of a critical lack of relevant data to assess progress, making it difficult to properly assess progress or evolving risks. When will the Scottish Government realise that the success of its plans does not come from good headlines, but from actually doing the hard work? Cabinet Secretary. So, Presiding Officer, if uh, the, his, the Member's interpretation of this report is that it is scathing on the Scottish Government, uh, given the comments they have made about the UK Government and the fact that the Scottish Government is ahead of them in climate adaptation, I wonder what it means for the UK Government and their failure in this area of uh, policy. But I am sure the Member, as you would often expect from the Opposition, will be selective on aspects of the report that they choose to select. Uh, so, for example, we can pick up on issues which it highlights in terms of in transport, the progress that we are making on rail and climate change and the way in which we are taking forward policies to provide greater resilience there, the progress that has been made in planning for adaptation and commercial forestry, again highlighted within the report, and in a number of other areas where it highlights that Scotland is demonstrating strong, clear leadership in these areas. But clearly, we need to do more, and that is certainly what we intend to do, and we will respond to the recommendations within this report that rightly raises a challenge that climate adaptation has to be measured against the same actions that we take when tackling climate change overall, and the need to make sure that they are treated in an equal fashion. That is why the increasing funding we are putting into a range of areas is to help to support the embedding of our actions to tackle climate adaptation, and we will look to do more of that as we move forward. And supplementary, Willie Rennie. I do not think most people would agree with the Minister that the measure of success has been marginally better than the Conservatives, but nevertheless, a vision is, counts for not very much when the action is not delivered. 
So in the report, it says very clearly the majority of Scotland's shoreline is not covered by shoreline management plans. I'm deeply concerned about many properties and land in my constituency. So what is the Minister doing to make sure these plans get delivered and get delivered soon? Cabinet Secretary. I, all, I do concede that measuring yourself against the Conservative Party and Government of Westminster isn't a high bar to set yourself. Uh, but what I can assure the member is that we are certainly doing more than that low bar that they operate at on a consistent basis. In relation to the point the member uh, makes, he may be aware that we are already taking forward the second phase of the Dynamic Coast project, which was launched just in August of last year, which I launched in Montrose, a key part of which is the modelling work that has been undertaken to look at coastal erosion and the potential risks that that could have in individual parts of the country, no doubt in areas of his own uh, constituency. And that particular piece of work is to understand the areas of risk and the potential mitigations that then need to be put in place in order to manage that. This is a piece of work that is ongoing just now. He will appreciate the complexity and some of the challenges with it. But the dynamic uh, at coast projects is specifically to try and address the type of concern that the member has raised. And we are providing funding to try to support local authorities in taking forward some of the mitigation measures that are necessary in order to address the issue of coastal erosion. And brief supplementary, Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that, while well, clearly there is much more to do, the Scottish Government efforts and ambitions on tackling the climate crisis has been widely recognised, including from Chris Stark, the CEO of the Climate Change Committee, who told GMS recently the Scottish Government has been noticeably better than other parts of the UK at putting a vision around what they want to do to make Scotland more climate resilient. We do not see that, for example, from DEFRA in the UK. Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely. Officer, look, I, I recognise that, um, uh, that we are making progress on this. The report recognises that we are making progress on it, but also calls for us to do more uh, in order to show greater urgency in moving forward in tackling the issue of climate adaptation. Yes, we are doing more uh, than other parts of the UK. We are further ahead than other parts of the UK, although I recognise that Westminster, the bar, is a low measure. Having said that, what we need to do is also recognise that there are further measures that we need to take forward. And that is why, as I mentioned, for example, the £150 million for flood risk management, the £12 million for coastal adaptation that I made reference to, the investment we are putting into areas such as people and restoration, all of these are measures which help to support our climate adaptation work, uh, alongside investment of £60 million in climate adaptation on our trunk road network. Uh, but we need to look at what more we can do to ad adapt to the changing climate which we face. And you can be assured that this government will be determined to do that and to continue to show the leadership that is necessary, not just here in Scotland and the UK, but internationally in tackling climate adaptation. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions on net zero energy and transport. And there will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business. Thank you.